It's two in the morning, you've got the splitting headache, and you're trying to decide, do I tough this thing out, call the doctor in the morning, or hightail it to the ER? Yeah. It's a dilemma I think a lot of us have faced at some point. And in today's deep dive, we're really going to try to equip you with the knowledge to navigate those really, really trippy decisions. Right. So to break this all down, we have an expert joining us today. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So this document, it might seem straightforward from the title, but it actually gets into a lot of important nuances about urgent versus emergency care. And then also, when is it time to bring in a specialist? Absolutely. So right off the bat, it distinguishes between urgency and emergency. Yes. And these are two terms that honestly, I think often get used kind of interchangeably. So can you help us understand What's the difference here and why does it even matter? Yeah, and this document does a fantastic job of really drawing a clear line, which I think is super helpful for people to kind of wrap their heads around when they're in those really stressful situations. Right. So emergencies, those are life-threatening situations where every second counts. So we're talking heart attack symptoms, we're talking major bleeding, a severe allergic reaction. Right. Urgencies, while serious, aren't immediately life-threatening. Hmm. So you want to get them seen relatively quickly, but it allows for a little more thoughtful decision-making and planning. Okay. So something like a persistent high fever, minor wounds, even something like really severe pain can fall into this category. So it makes a lot of sense when you lay it out like that. But, right. I, but I can imagine that it can be really hard to sort of stay level-headed when you are in the heat of the moment, right? Because like a sprained ankle at two in the morning can feel really, really urgent. Oh, for sure. And I think that's why this document's emphasis on what the emergency room is really for is really important. Because I think a lot of times we go to the emergency room for things that, frankly, the emergency room is not equipped to deal with or shouldn't be dealing with. Because they're there for emergencies. Exactly. Right. And it's easy to forget that choosing the ER for something that's non-urgent, it can actually lead to longer wait times and even potentially less personalized care because they're having to triage. Right. This document actually uses the example of a persistent cold, right? If you go to the ER with a cold, you're probably going to be waiting much longer than if you went to see your primary care physician. And that wait time can have real consequences, right? Mm -hmm. That could be delaying care for someone who is experiencing a true emergency. That's a really good point. I honestly hadn't thought about it like that. So then how does the document suggest that we navigate this? Like, should I stay or should I go? Dilemma when it comes to urgent care situations. Well, I think it all comes down to honest self-assessment. And they even have this really, I think, powerful question in the document. They say, you know, ask yourself, am I considering the ER because it's convenient or because it's truly necessary? Right. Because the convenience of it shouldn't outweigh the reality of the situation. Yeah, as tempting as that, you know, no appointment needed sign <laughs> can be. For sure. And I think that's why it's important to explore what some of those alternative solutions might be. And this document actually does a good job of highlighting things like walk-in clinics. This can be a really great option for many urgent but not emergency situations. That makes a lot of sense. Now, this document also goes into the world of specialists. So yeah. these are, you know, medical professionals who've dedicated years to kind of mastering a particular area of medicine. What are your thoughts on kind of when is it the right call to see a specialist versus maybe trying to, you know, stick with your primary care physician or even like an urgent care? Yeah. And this is where things get really interesting, I think. Right. You're talking about, you know, you, you think about specialists. They train for five plus years after medical school. So wow. You're talking about someone who brings this incredible depth of specialized knowledge to the table. So you're not just paying for their time. You're paying for that expertise that, you know, frankly, your general practitioner just may not have. Right. If you think about it, you know, a cardiologist, for instance, yeah. someone who's, you know, they've dedicated their lives to understanding the heart. Yeah. It's like the difference between having a general contractor and then like a master electrician. You know, both can be very good at what they do. For sure. But if you have something really specific, you need that specialty knowledge. Absolutely. So are there any kind of downsides or things that we should be aware of if we're thinking about going to a specialist? Yeah. And the document does a good job of highlighting that, you know, specialist visits can be more expensive. They may involve more complex procedures or treatments. And in a lot of cases, you will need a referral from your primary care physician to even get in the door. 
Mm. So it's not always as simple as just deciding, I want to see a specialist. And yeah. then you get in to see them the next day. Right. So, you know, I think being aware of those things and understanding, you know, that there are going to be some hoops to jump through, that's important. But I think when utilized effectively, specialists can be absolutely invaluable to your healthcare journey. So it sounds like, you know, if we do find ourselves in a situation where we need to see a specialist, there are some things we can do to kind of make that visit as, I don't know, like as productive as possible. Because, you know, I've definitely had that experience where I walk out of a specialist appointment and I'm like, oh, shoot, I forgot to ask about this, that, and the other. Right, right. So what are some things that we can do to be prepared? Yeah, I think being prepared is absolutely key. And the document actually does a really good job of kind of laying out some things to think about. So first and foremost, it stresses, you know, understanding your current diagnosis or at least what you suspect is going on. Have you done some basic research, like even just some basic research on potential treatment options, things like that? I think that that could be really empowering. Yeah, it's almost like showing up to like, I don't know, like a business meeting with a really well-researched proposal. It's like yeah. you are showing that you are an active participant in this. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You're not just passively receiving information. Right. And then, of course, you know, making sure that your medical records, any relevant test results have been shared with the specialist beforehand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That can save everyone a lot of time, a lot of potential frustration. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, speaking of kind of streamlining the process, mm. you know, the document also emphasizes being really, really clear about what your primary care physician wants the specialist to do. So is the specialist taking over the case completely? Are they confirming a diagnosis? Are there specific tests that they want run? You know, having that conversation with your PCP beforehand can really make a world of difference. Yeah, because otherwise I feel like it can be like a name of telephone, right? Where it's like, well, yeah. I thought you were going to tell them this. Exactly, okay. exactly. And nobody wins in that situation. Right, exactly, exactly. So you know, it's all about kind of fostering that collaborative approach to your healthcare. Yeah. And on that note, they even suggest, you know, actually requesting that the specialist keep your primary care physician in the loop. So, you know, sharing any new results or recommendations oh, interesting. with your primary care physician, you know, as they come up. Because like a closed loop, a lot of times that can lead to a dead end. Exactly. Exactly. So the more open the communication is between all parties, I think the better. Mm. You know, it just ensures that everyone's on the same page and everyone is kind of working together towards the best possible outcome for you. So I think those are all really, really key things. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked about kind of navigating urgent versus emergency care. When is it time to bring in a specialist? But this document actually goes a layer deeper. It talks about, you know, this idea of preventative care and really adopting a healthier lifestyle so that ideally we reduce our need to even have to interface with, you know, urgent medical situations in the first place. Right. And I think this is where it gets really empowering, right? Because I think a lot of times we think about urgent care as this thing that kind of just happens to us and we don't have a lot of control. But, you know, the document really stresses that we actually can play a very active role in our own well-being and that a lot of this stuff doesn't have to be left up to chance. Because wouldn't it be amazing if you could just, like, prevent the check engine light from going off in the first place? Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, they actually give some kind of practical tips on ways to do that, you know, encouraging things like maintaining a balanced diet. Getting regular exercise, making sure your vaccinations are up to date, avoiding smoking, like all of those kind of, you know, classic, you know, pillars of good health that I think sometimes we just kind of like forget about in our day to day lives. Right. But I think they're important for a reason. Yeah. You know, the document highlights, for example, that regular exercise, mm -hmm. you know, not only does it help manage weight, boost your mood, but it can actually reduce your risk of developing certain types of cancers, mm. heart disease, type 2 diabetes. Wow. All of which are things that, you know, often land people in urgent care. That's a really good point. Right. Because it's easy to think about those healthy habits in isolation. But then when you actually connect them to like, oh, this is going to reduce my risk of this specific condition. It does. It makes it feel a lot more tangible, I think. Absolutely. It's not just about adding years to your life. It's about adding life to your years. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that old saying, like, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Right. Or in this case, maybe like a whole battery of medical tests. Exactly. And like a whole stack of specialist referrals. Yeah. And it's about, you know, shifting from this kind of reactive approach to healthcare to a more proactive approach. Right. And I think that that can be so much more empowering. Totally. Because 
again, we think about like, oh, I have to go to urgent care. It's like <laughs> that feels very out of our control. But I think this document does a really good job of reminding us that we can really play a much more significant role in our own well-being. And that, you know, taking care of our health, it's not just about like avoiding a trip to the ER, although that is, you know, definitely a bonus. What? It's about really like living our healthiest, most fulfilling lives overall. Precisely. It's about you know, reducing our risk of chronic illness, mm -hmm. having the energy to pursue the things that we're passionate about, and just feeling our best day in and day out. Totally. So as we kind of wrap up this deep dive today into, you know, when to seek urgent care, when to maybe take a little bit more of a preventative approach, what's kind of like the big takeaway that you hope our listeners walk away with today? You know, I think the biggest thing is, while, yes, it's really important to understand those nuances of urgent medical situations and when to seek care and all of that, I think it's equally important to remember that, you know, our health is this ongoing journey. Right. It's not just this series of isolated incidents. Yeah. And so it's about, you know, really making those daily choices that contribute to our overall well-being. Exactly. And I think this document just highlights that beautifully. You know, those choices often have a much bigger impact than we realize. So true. Well, to our listeners, as you go about your day, you know, we'll leave you with this kind of thought provoking question inspired <laughs> by our deep dive today. OK, what's one small step that you can take today to really prioritize your health and potentially, you know, reduce your reliance on having to access urgent care in the future? I like it. Could it be, you know, adding an extra serving of vegetables to your plate tonight? Could it mm -hmm. be, you know, taking a walk during your lunch break tomorrow? Could it be finally scheduling that checkup that you've been putting off. Right. We'll leave you to ponder that. <laughs> Until next time, be well.